Hello! Before we dive into this week's episode, here's a trailer for a fellow podcaster. If you like what you hear, then go and check them out. Hello, this is Cindy Martinez, the host of Welcome to the Neighborhood podcast. Ever since I was young, I've had a passion for true crime and the paranormal. This podcast focuses on cases and stories from different cities while making the Chicagoland my hometown or base. If you find yourself intrigued by crime and all things spooky, find us on Apple, Spotify, and Google. We post new episodes every Friday. Be sure to stop by. Welcome to Crime Divers. I'm Laura. And I'm Jo. And join us for this week's episode called Trial by Media. now December. It is December. I know, nearly Christmas time. I thought maybe for the next two or three weeks we could do some episodes that are sort of focused around Yeah, Christmas centered time. around Christmas. Yeah. I mean like they're not gonna be happy, they're not gonna be festive. No. But they're just happened around Christmas. About yeah, but like sort of December and around Christmas, so yeah. So the this first one is called Trial by Media and I'm sure the majority of the UK, anyway, will recognise this case because it's about Joanna Yates, mm. which I'm sure you remember, don't you? Yes, I have heard of that one. Yeah, I actually remember... I was on holiday. Oh, yeah. No, I wasn't. I went on holiday just afterwards. Just afterwards? Yes, I was in Gran Canaria for, uh, like, three weeks. That's when you went on Boxing Day? Yeah, I went on Boxing Day, yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> not that that is yeah. relevant let's, at all. Let's dive in. <laughs> yep, let's dive in. So, Joanna Claire Yates was born on the 19th of April, 1985, to David and Teresa Yates in Hampshire, England. She was privately educated at Embley Park School, which, fun fact, is the former family home of Florence Nightingale. Oh, right. They didn't know that, did you? Oh, turned out yeah. in the school, did they? Yep. So Joanne, Joanna studied for her A levels at Peter Simmons College and graduated with a degree in landscape architecture from the University of Gloucestershire. In two thousand and eight, December two thousand and eight, sorry, um, twenty three year old Joanna met Greg Reardon, who was a twenty five year old architect. Mm-hmm. They started a relationship and moved in together in two thousand and nine. In October two thousand and ten. They moved into a flat at 44... Right, I don't actually know how to say this. I hear a surprise. I know, but it's, it's sort of, like, written as Cannons Road. But I'm sure I heard somebody calling it Cannon Road. So, right, I don't okay. know. Anyway, it's a build, it was a building divided into seven flats mm-hmm. um, in Clifton, which is in the suburb, suburbs of Bristol. Right. So on the 17th of December 2010, Greg travelled to Sheffield to visit his family for the weekend. Uh, After work that day, Joanna went out for a drink with some workmates. Um, She stayed for a couple of hours and then she left the pub to go home. She stopped off at the supermarket Waitrose, uh, but she didn't buy anything. And then she popped into another shop um, and bought two bottles of cider. Then she went to Tesco's and bought a pizza and then headed home. She had been seen on CCTV, which is why we, we know. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah we should, we should be. So, Greg um, arrived in Sheffield at 10.30 that night. And he texted Joanna saying, made it okay, good traffic, did you have a good time in the pub? But he got no response. Mm-hmm. Um, he tried to call and text her a few times over the weekend, but he couldn't get a hold of her. Never a good sign? No. Um, when he got back to the flat on the Sunday, Joanna wasn't there. So he tried ringing her mobile again and he heard her phone ringing in a jacket pocket. Oh no. 
So who, who's who goes anywhere without their phone these days? Well, and also her handbag. Oh right, okay. So he checked her handbag and her purse and her glasses and everything else that she would usually take out with her mm-hmm. was was there. Mm-hmm. So obviously he was starting to panic now. So if he phoned Joanna's parents to ask if she was there, um, and she wasn't. So her mum told Greg to phone the police, and her parents decided to go over and yeah, you know, see what they could do. Uh-huh. So Joanna's parents got there, um, her mum looked in Joanna's handbag and she saw the receipt for the pizza that she bought for Tesco on the right. Friday night. Yeah. But there was no sign of the pizza or the wrapping or the box or anything, which was strange. Oh right, okay. Her, her boots that she'd been wearing that day were still in the flat, uh-huh. plus her coat and handbag, so they knew that something was definitely wrong, especially because of the weather. Uh-huh. I'm sure anyone from the UK will remember the winter of 2010. Like, oh we had God, heavy yeah. snow for weeks, didn't we? Yeah. It was just... Oh, man, I actually, like, I had a, a Land Rover at the time car, and honestly, oof, it was a terrible car, but that was great for that winter because I could just <laughs> drive everywhere. And it didn't matter how deep the snow was. It was just. Was that the one that leaked though? Was that when you were sitting? Yeah, the, it was that one. Yeah, it was. It wasn't the best. That 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 was the only thing that it was good at was it was in the snow. For the snow, yeah. Because I actually remember, you know, in one of the job that I was working at the time, you know, there were there was like members of my staff because I was the manager at the time, and and they couldn't get to work because they were snowing yeah. and stuff. And obviously, I had land. I actually remember having to go. And, pick my boss up from her house because she couldn't get out but because I had the car mm-hmm. then I could go and take her to a few shops and stuff so it was, it was great for that yeah just not great for uh, anything else <laughs> no because when you were sitting in it you were getting wet because <laughs> your sunroof was leaking yeah. but yeah I mean like that I mean the airports were closing and because like obviously as we said before I was going on holiday on That's Boxing right. Day and luckily the, the, the airport had been shut for a few days I think That's right, yeah. and luckily it opened again on Boxing Day because it stopped snowing for a while, so we got away on bo- on the Boxing Day to go away to Gran Canaria, and then the next again day the airport shut again because oh, it? it was it was that bad. Uh-huh. So we were really lucky that we never got our flights cancelled. Yeah, but yeah, funny. so obviously, so they were worried to me yeah. because you know the weather was that bad, mm-hmm. and she you know she's not got her, her jacket or boots. Mm-hmm. So Joanna still hadn't been found by the twenty first of December. So there's a, pre- a press conference was called and her mum and dad pleaded with anyone with information to come forward. But, you know, there was just nothing. She just seemed to have Vanished. disappeared, yeah. Yeah. So the other residents in the flats were the first people um, that the police wanted to talk to, mm-hmm. um, especially the landlord, Christopher Jeffries, who had keys to Joanna's flat. Um, but all he could tell him was that on the night that Joanna disappeared, he was in his flat alone reading. Mm-hmm. Did he stay in the... Yeah, he lived there as well. He, um, I think, he he um, owned three of the flats, so he had number one, two, and five. Right. So he lived in number five, I think, and Joanna was in number one. I think it was. So yeah, he. So he lived there. Yeah. Um, on Christmas Day, two thousand and ten, around eight forty-five a.m. A couple called Mr. and Mrs. Birch were walking their dog along Longwood Lane and they passed what they de- what they described as a mound underneath the snow. Mm-hmm. So they had walked past, but then kind of thought, hmm, there's something not quite right there, you know, so they kind of... They, so they went back and had a look properly, and they realised there was a body. Oh, God. Oh, so no. Joanna had been found, and her poor parents were told on Christmas Day oh, that shit. their daughter had been murdered. That's not a nice Christmas present. No, that must, they mustn't be able to celebrate Christmas. I know, I mean, how could you after that? Because no. you just remember every year. Um, so it took three days to determine the cause of death as the, po- the post-mortem had been delayed due to Joanna's body being found in freezing conditions. Mm-hmm. She had been stra- it turned out that she'd been strangled to death. Mm-hmm. So now the missing person's inquiry was now a murder investigation. Mm-hmm. There, there had been no forced entry into the flat so she must have let her killer in. So that pointed it to be someone that she knew. She knew, yeah. So Christopher Jeffries, the landlord, who was a 65-year-old retired school teacher, had spoken to Greg on the afternoon of the 17th of December. So he knew that Greg was going to Sheffield uh-huh. and that Joanna would be on her own all weekend. Right. He had a spare key at the flat, mm-hmm. um, so he became the prime suspect and he was arrested on yeah. the suspicion of Joanna Mate. Mate? Sorry. <laughs> 
Joanna Yee is his murder. Mm-hmm. I remember. I remember his face. <laughs> I think everybody does because he was plastered all over the papers. Yeah, I mean, yes. as I said, I was in Gran Canaria mm-hmm. and we got British newspapers over there. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, so we knew what was that. going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I just had to move there. The police had been told by uh, my neighbour, Vincent Tabak, that Christopher's car had been parked at the back of the building that night, but then it had moved. And obviously Christopher had said that he'd been in all night reading, oh, right, so... Yeah. But Christopher had two cars, and when he was arrested, he was asked for the keys to his car. Because mm. at that point, the police thought he only had one vehicle. Right. So he handed over a set of keys. When he was being questioned after being arrested, he was asked why he only handed over one set of keys because obviously they realised that yeah, he had two. Cars, yeah. And Christopher just said because he assumed that those were the keys that they wanted. Uh-huh. So the police it looked suspicious that he hadn't volunteered the keys yeah. for the other car. Uh-huh. So before and uh, basically before and during his arrest, I mean the media had him down as guilty. Yeah, and, as you said, I mean, like his face, was all, his over, face. Yeah. His face was all over the papers. And it was quite lines. odd. It was quite odd as well. Yes, it right was way. quite an odd person. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, quite eccentric, I think the word is. Yeah. Um, but Christopher said, "Quote: I had no suspicion whatsoever that I might even be considered a suspect, since, as far as I was concerned, there wasn't a shred of evidence to that effect." Mm-hmm. End quote. Yeah. He didn't own a TV or read the newspapers very often, so he had no idea that he was the attention of the media. Right, okay. Because he, like, he was the attention of the media before he got arrested, like, like the day before. They just sort of, you know, identified him and thought, oh, that's it, he's got, he's got to be him. Yeah, basically. basically. That's, that's what they did. Um, the front page of The Sun showed a small photo of Joanna next to a big photo of Christopher from 30 years ago with blue hair. I mean, it did. I mean, I saw the picture. I don't remember that. Blue hair. Yeah, he had blue hair. And it, you know, it did look a wee bit different, yeah. should I say. But I don't think there's anything wrong with different. Like, no, well, you know, everybody's it. their own person. But Absolutely. anyway, so the hel- the headline read, The Strange Mr. Jeffries, Kids Nickname for Ex Teacher Suspect. Then page four was dominated by four words, each accompanied by an explanatory phrase. These were, so the word, um, the first word was weird. Mm-hmm. Um, and it said strange talk strange walk I don't know how he walked so right okay um, posh loves culture and poetry what is wrong with that well exactly what is wrong with that yeah lewd is that how you say it lewd lewd yeah yeah made sexual remarks creepy loner with blue rinse hair like 30 years ago though yeah but so what have you got blue rinse well, hair yeah. doesn't it make it creepy exactly anyway so the report began Quote, Joanna Yates, murder suspect, Chris Jeffries, was last night branded a creepy oddball by ex-pupils, a teaching colleague and neighbours, end quote. See, if I remember rightly, I, I felt like this case became more about him. Oh, definitely. forgot about the poor yeah. victim in it, which was, you know, Joanna, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, she had lost her life, but yet the focus was just all about him. Definitely, it was. Um, I mean... As I said, I mean, he was, he was all over the papers, and you, as I said, you were. It kind of took the focus off yeah, her, really, exactly, yeah. uh, off the victim. Mm-hmm. Um, so the report went on to say that he had a really bad temper and threw things in a classroom, and that he invited pupils to his home and often made sexual remarks. And it is also said that he was unkempt and dirty, a loner, domineering, and believed to be a homosexual. I don't know what his sexuality has to do with anything. Well, exactly. Which, that kind of annoyed me because I was like, so what? Doesn't make you a killer or yeah, a Yeah, so what? Or if he, if, whether he's a homosexual or not, so what? Well, exactly. There's no need for anything to be written well, about that. Well, of course, that's the, the great British media that you know, they'll jump mm. on anything. No. Um, so the Daily Mirror had a headline which read, Joe Suspect is a peeping Tom. <laughs> On the inside pages, they called Christopher a nutty professor with a bizarre past who was arrogant, um, rude and a snob, had a bad temper and peering through his tenants' windows. The paper also reported that his eccentric manner and long-term bachelor status sparked unfounded school gossip that he was gay. Again, so what? Yeah. 
Um, the Daily Mail called him Mr. Strange. The Daily Star's headlines were Joe Landlord, a creep who freaked out schoolgirls, and Angry Weirdo had feral temper. The Mirror reported that Christopher had an A to Z of Bristol in his car, so that was evidence because mm -hmm. maps were on his back seat. Right. Um, Do you know what I find really terrible? I mean, I don't, there was, the focus you know, was nowhere near what it is now, but you know, you think what the focus on mental health is now. And look what that all those papers have done about this poor guy. I mean, before he's mm -hmm. even been convicted of anything, they've got him down and, and all maybe his worst traits or whatever it is about him, they've basically splashed it all over the papers. I mean, I know you... Shouldn't be allowed to do that. Exactly. I mean, I know you're saying he didn't really read the papers or see the TV, so maybe he didn't see the full brunt of it. But, I mean, how bad is that on Sunday's mental health to have all that said about you before you've even been either convicted or, or no. found innocent of something, you know, it's, it's awful. It is, it's absolutely disgraceful. Mm. Um, so the, the papers painted him as a volatile, morbid and sexually repressed. Plus he knew his tenants' movements and had access to Joanna's flat. All the stuff that the media was reporting was founded almost entirely on unnamed witnesses. So in other words, a load of crap. Yeah. Well, maybe, well, I don't know. <laughs> we can't say whether it's true or not because yeah but anyway um there were people who had spoken to the press in a positive light but yet these conversations were either not printed or it would be like a tiny tiny bit at the end of the report so basically they weren't interested in hearing anything nice about no him. they were just interested in the they, they the decided stuff. that he was the guy yeah. that was their man that was it and yeah. they were just gonna like totally vilify him yeah um a former tenant, a friend, his former headmaster, a neighbour and a colleague described a man who was a good teacher, a responsible landlord and an active member of the community. And there were several people who just did not believe that he was capable of killing anyone. Yeah. If you put all that information together with the other available facts, the reports could have been so different. Mm -hmm. This man had taught for 34 years in a well-known local independent school without one single blemish on his record. He was involved in Neighbourhood Watch, the Liberal Democrat Party and a number of conservation campaigns. He had a large circle of friends, he owned a few properties um, and he was studying for a degree in French. But the media didn't want to print all that stuff because that doesn't, that doesn't sound like a killer. You know, it doesn't affect their profile. The media had already decided that Christopher Jeffries had murdered Joanna Yates and I think most of the country did as well because of what well, they were I printing. I believed it. Yeah. Had, yeah, I believed that that was the case at the time. Like he, yeah, I mean, I remember it as well. It was like, oh yeah, and because you saw pictures of him, mm -hmm. and yeah, he does look a bit different. Mm -hmm. And because of what they were saying, yeah. you did think, yeah, it was definitely him. That was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, Joanna's boyfriend, Greg, he actually issued a statement though, saying that the finger pointing and character assassination of an as yet innocent man, man was shameful, which I thought, what? A good, what a good guy to yeah, say yeah. that because you know that's his girlfriend's been murdered I know because he could have easily just went yeah that's him that's, yeah. you know, I believe that he's the one and been like no I'm not defending you in any way but yeah yeah so I thought that was quite good for, for him to say that so the police had checked Christopher's cars for forensic evidence and found nothing he endured three days of questioning and he spent two nights in a cell and eventually he was released without charge mm -hmm. So police then decided to look into Vincent Tabak, the neighbour who had reported that Christopher's car had been moved on the night of Joanna's murder. Mm -hmm. um, because of that false statement and the fact that he had been alone in his flat that night as well, made them suspicious of him. Mm -hmm. So Vincent had a girlfriend, Tanya, but she wasn't there that night. Joanna's parents had spoken to them both in the days after Joanna's disappearance. They said that Tanya was lovely and asked, She'd asked if there was anything they could do, but Vincent was quiet and didn't really speak. Right. Well, to them, anyway. Mm -hmm. He spoke a lot about the missing persons case to his friends, work colleagues and his girlfriend, but he would make it clear that he didn't really know Joanna at all. Mm -hmm. Vincent and Tanya went to Cambridge on the 23rd of December to spend Christmas with Tanya's parents. Then on the 28th of December, Vincent travelled to Holland, which is where he's from, yeah. to visit his family, but I'm not sure if Tanya went with him or not. Right. So police went to, went to Holland to interview him, and they asked for a volunteer. Vo what was that? <laughs> <laughs> they asked for a voluntary DNA sample, and as he was reluctant to do so, the officer who was taking the sample phoned the incident room in Bristol to report it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. After testing, police discovered that Tabak's DNA was on Joanna's body. Mm. So, Vincent Tabak was arrested on the 20th of January 2011 on suspicion of murdering Joanna Yates. One person who struggled to believe he was guilty was actually Christopher Jeffries. Oh, really? Yeah, and he was actually really worried that what had happened to him was now happening to Tabak. Right. Because I don't actually, I think, I, I could be wrong, but I think that Vincent Tabak could have been his other tenant. Right, okay. But I'm not, I mean, he lived in the building, but yeah. I'm not sure if he was his, his I'm not sure. Right. Um, but he, as I said, he was worried that, you know, the same was happening to him. Mm-hmm. Um, in Holland, TV news reports detailed his arrest, but journalists there also wondered if Tabak could be the victim of a grave miscarriage of justice fueled by the frenzied British media. Mm-hmm. Dutch people were saying on the internet forums that they thought he was innocent as well. Right. But I think that I think it was mainly judged on the fact that Je- that Christopher had been innocent. I think they were like, yeah. well, if they can do it to one person, then... Yeah, they can do it to another Yeah. So Tabak's family even appeared on TV claiming that he was innocent. Right. He knew him as a loving man and he had been texting his girlfriend, Tanya, that night. Mm-hmm. At 9.25pm, he had texted her, uh, Tanya, saying, Miss you loads, it's boring here without you. And at 10.30pm, he had said, can't wait to pick you up. So it was hard for a lot of people to believe that a man who had committed murder could be so cool and calm as to send those messages. Yeah. But, um, so in custody, Tabak refused to help the police with their inquiries. He just kept saying no comment. Mm -hmm. He did give a written statement, though, and in that he said he didn't know Joanna Yates and that he didn't know anything about her murder. Mm -hmm. So Tabak's movements on the 17th of December didn't really make sense. He said that he'd taken a walk in the snow that night, but there was no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. He had driven to an Asda supermarket, which was a few miles away, rather than just going to a local one. Right. Police needed more evidence, so they started to comb footage from all the street cameras. They saw him walking into Asda, and then straight back out again, and then he returned again a minute later, and he bought some beer, rock salt and crisps. He had taken a route where there were plenty of cameras, whereas that wouldn't be the obvious route that someone would take. So it looked like to police that he was making sure that he was caught on the CCTV. Yeah, to make it look like he's got an alibi. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, After Tabak's arrest, forensic computer analysts went through his computer. There was a lot of material which contained extreme pornography. um, And it also showed that he had done a lot of searching about Joanna's disappearance and the investigation into her death. Right. At 10.30pm on the 19th of December, he had been on Google Maps looking at Longwood Lane, which is where Joanna's body had eventually been found. Right. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All looks suspicious. Yeah. So on the 21st of January, police were given more time to hold tab- Tabak for questioning. Even though the DNA evidence had linked him to Joanna's body, it wasn't conclusive enough to charge him. Right. So they needed a breakthrough or they would have to release him. Mm-hmm. So an intensive forensic search of Tabak's car finally gave them what they needed. They found blood in the boot of the car. After being tested, it was confirmed as being Joanna's blood. So he was charged with her murder. Even after that, though, he was still saying no comment. Right, okay. Um, eventually, after three weeks in custody, he decided to talk. Mm-hmm. When he was go- sorry, when he was on remand on the 8th of February, he told a chaplain that he was going to plead guilty to killing Joanna. But even though he admitted to killing her, he hadn't admitted to murder. Right. So searches of his computer found that he had been looking at English law. So before he was even arrested, he had been looking for information about how to get the lightest punishment. He had been researching the differences between murder and manslaughter. Right, okay. So he was basically planning that if he did get caught, he would say that he killed her by accident. So obviously he would get the manslaughter. Yeah, Yeah, a lesser sentence. But the Crown Pros- Prosecution Service made the de- de- decision mm-hmm, thank you, to pursue the murder charge, meaning that Joanna's family and her boyfriend Greg would have to endure a complicated trial mm-hmm. and hear the killer's version of events from his own mouth for the first time. Right. On the 4th of October 2011, the trial began. He denied murder and entered a plea of manslaughter instead. Mm-hmm. He claimed that he had walked past Joanna's kitchen window and they had waved to each other and she had just gestured to him to come in. When he was asked in court to show them 
how Joanna had gestured to him, he just demonstrated what looked like a wave, like she was saying hello, mm-hmm. like not an invite to yeah. come into the flat. Yeah. But anyway, he said that he that she opened the door and he went in and they chatted for ten minutes in the kitchen. Right. He said that she made a flirtatious comment to him and he tried to kiss her. He said she screamed she screamed and in order to stop her he put his hand over her mouth. When he took his hand away, she screamed again and then he strangled her. He claimed he didn't intend to kill her, but he just panicked. <laughs> well, I know, as we've always said, everybody's different. Everybody reacts to things different. But in all my years, if anybody's tried to kiss me and I haven't wanted to, mm-hmm. I haven't screamed. I've just, like, you know, kind of moved away or, yeah, like, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, move your head away and say, no, no, you know. Yeah. I mean... If it was a lot more forceful, yeah, then I could understand her screaming. But the way that he said it, he just tried to kiss her and she started screaming. Yeah. Now, to me, that's a hell of an overreaction to somebody just trying to kiss you. Oh, yeah, I would have thought so, yeah. So, either, yeah, she did scream, but he's he was more forceful yeah, than, he's saying. than what he's saying, or she didn't scream at all. Yeah. I think. That's my opinion. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, because I just don't, I don't see why... Somebody no, because I've, I've done that before. Like, no, what are you doing? Like, no. Yeah, no, no I, I'm not interested. I don't want to kiss you. You know, you'll maybe even just push Especially him away. Especially if, if she obviously knew him as well. It's not like it was like a complete stranger that was trying to kiss her. Yeah. So she would have no reason to maybe be fearful at that point. It would just be like a, yeah. an, awkward, an awkward moment. You'd think, go, no, no, what are you doing? That's what I thought. Because I thought if she screamed, then she must have been scared. Yeah. So if, if, if she did scream. Uh-huh. Um, so if she was scared, he must have done more than just try to kiss her. Yeah, exactly, because she obviously knows him mm-hmm. enough to have, well, if she has gestured him in or waved at him or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, like, surely if she did scream from him trying to kiss her, surely he must have done something. She would, he must, she, your first reaction would be to pull away from him, wouldn't yeah. it? Not scream. Yeah, I wouldn't thought so. So I think, well, yeah. obviously he's a liar anyway. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, we know that. <laughs> yeah, to some experts, Vincent Tabak showed signs of being a serial killer in the making. Oh, really? Yeah. One expert said he does present a very un- unusual profile to be a one-offence killer when he is this organised and this systematic and this apparently emotionally disconnected from the tragedy he had caused. Mm. So Tabak was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 20 years. Well, see, at least that's a bit more reasonable. Yeah. Why did it... Why- you know, that's Yeah, that's the better. other cases that... Yeah, like that, that I could go, okay, that's a bit more acceptable. Yeah, that is, to me, that's more acceptable. I mean, whether, obviously, he would serve the full 20 years, probably not, if he's on good behaviour, but at least... Yeah, but if it's a minimum tariff, surely he has to. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, he has to serve the minimum tariff, and then he can oh, right, apply. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that, that, to me, is far more reasonable. Mm-hmm, definitely, um, than previous ones. Previous yeah. ones, yes. So... As for Christopher Jeffries, oh yes, forgot about him. Yeah. That. <laughs> well, he was awarded a six-figure sum of money in compensation. So this came after eight newspapers agreed to pay damages, which included the Sun, the Mirror, the Sunday Mirror, the Daily Mail, the Daily Record, the Daily Express, the Daily Star. And the Scotsman. Like just about every newspaper in the UK, basically. So the the Mirror and the Sun were also both part of a contempt of court case mm-hmm. led by the Attorney General at the time, Dominic Greaves, which saw the papers fined £50,000 for two articles and £18,000 for one article, mm-hmm. respectively. According to, the, to a Daily Mail article from September 2013, uh, Christopher Jeffries also received a £50,000 payout and a, an apology from the Avon and Somerset Police for loss of rental income and damage to property that was caused during their investigation. So I'm assuming by that, like people vandalized to must have vandalised yeah, yeah. like his flats and stuff. Because <clears throat> everybody knew where he lived. Well, yeah, and they all thought it was him. And everybody thought that he was a murderer and he was there, wasn't. There was a, there was a, a, a mini-series about that, wasn't there? There was a series, yeah. I remember watching that. The, the Lost Honour of Christopher Jeffries, yeah. it's called. Mm-hmm. <coughs> um... And the guy that played him. Oh, brilliant actor. Yeah, he brilliant. did, he he did, did really so really well. Good. The resemblance that yeah, he had. Yeah, the resemblance. I mean, sometimes when I look at photos, I'm like, is that the actor or is that yeah. um, the actual real oh, guy? Oh, yeah, he played the part really, really well. He did, but like, I'm just so glad 
that he got com- I mean, I know money isn't everything, but yeah. at least he got an apology. He got oh, deservedly you so. Know, yeah. He got his, he got money. He got compensation because imagine being branded a murderer when he was telling the truth. All he did was sit. He was sitting in his house all night mm-hmm. reading. I know, but because of his character and his demeanor, because of the way that he looked, the way that he was, yeah, you know, it was like. It had to be him. And, and because of Vincent Tabak as well, because he was the one that told the police that, that his car, yeah. the car had been moved. Mm. So obviously he was trying to frame yeah. Christopher Jeffries. I know. But then I still feel feel really sorry for Joanna Yates because I feel like she's almost the forgotten person in the whole mm. case because, you know, it was her that lost her life, but it actually became about him. And obviously I feel yeah. sorry for him because it should never have been about him. But she was for, you know, the, the, the fact yeah. that she was murdered seems such a small part of that story now. Yeah, yeah, it does. It seems like, yeah, that, you know, this poor woman was murdered, but mm. it became such a massive thing about him. Yeah. And it, it kind of takes away from her, mm-hmm. which is part of the reason why I thought it would be good to tell her story as well. You know, like, I know a lot of this story was about him as well. Yeah. But, you know, she was here. She was, mm-hmm. she lived, you know, she oh. was murdered. So Exactly, for what? I mean, we still don't really know. Well, why? Like, yeah, for what reason? There isn't his excuse for killing her. Wasn't I'm sorry. You tried to kiss her, and she didn't want you. Yeah. That's not an excuse to kill somebody. Exactly. You should have just kind of well, stepped back. And it's funny. He's got a girlfriend. So what? What reason do they have to pursue that anyway? It's ridiculous. Know. You know, for what? A quick, a quick try to get a quick kiss out of somebody or something. God, no. Just because she made a flirtatious comment does not mean that it's alright to try and kiss her. Mm-mm. Lots of people have weak flirty comments. It doesn't mean anything. There's nothing wrong with a bit of flirting. I don't know. Harmless. You know, things. Exactly. And that's if she did. Well, yeah, exactly. We I don't mean, actually know if, if that was what happened. No, we we have no idea. And Sadly, only he'll know. And, and she would obviously have known exactly what happened that night. No matter what, though, like, I just think... I don't believe his story. No, no, I agree. I think I think there's clearly a lot more to it than mm-hmm. than what he's saying. But as we, you know, we're never going to know that because if he's not going to tell, no. but the evidence only goes so far with that. So, I mean, I'm glad he obviously got found and he got, you know, he got convicted of it and he got a what I would call a much more acceptable sentence. But you know, there was there was yeah, there was, he's been punished properly for that. Exactly. But okay, yeah. so I'll need to try and find something else. For next week, yes, some more Christmassy. Yes, so well, I told you it wasn't going to be very festive. No, festive. Um, oh, no. Yeah, so if you want to follow us on Instagram or Twitter, we are crime underscore divers underscore pod. We have a Facebook page, Crime Divers Podcast. You can email us at crime underscore divers underscore pod at outlook.com. We have uh, YouTube which is Crime Divers podcast and Crime Divers is all one word do I need to keep saying that every week as people know. well it's in the show notes yeah but anyway that's what it is <laughs> and Patreon is patreon.com slash Crime Divers I and think we will be there for some <laughs> bonus content yeah if anybody wants to come over and support support the might even podcast. have a bonus Christmas episode on there yeah I think I think there's going to be one on Christmas day so <laughs> although I don't know if people want to really spend their Christmas days listening to Listen, podcasts. We don't know what the hell's going to be happening this Christmas. Well, that's like, true. People, well, we've had a shit year, so why not have a murder on Christmas? Well, exactly. Anyway, right. So, see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.